Yes, we have to keep updating our, um, my bio on that because our number of grandchildren keeps kind of ratcheting up, you know. And, and it was a cool thing because uh, for a long time we just had uh, boys. So we were, we were cultivating the next generation of boys, which is great. Um, but when Elliot came along, who is almost two now, that the whole dynamic changed. And so she's kind of the princess. And um, as Ruthie indicated here, uh, we have our second granddaughter coming, which will be Elliot's sister. So we've got the girls are coming, man. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, today I want, I want to give you something you've been looking for for a long time. You notice the title in there? How to get what you want. Okay, so stay tuned, stick with me all the way through this, and you can find out how to get what you want. Okay, so this is, this is gonna be a good deal, right? You're gonna be glad you were here. But now to start, here's, here's the thing. Um, any of you have Catholic background? Does anybody here? Any kind of Catholic background at all? No? Okay. If you did, one of the things that you would have gone through is, is kind of, you know, a catechism. Are you familiar with what a catechism is? I mean, how, how that works? Okay. Um, most of you have blank stares. That could be that you're just not fully in yet. But uh, uh, catechism, it's actually a, a great tool. Um, the way catechism works is, is that it, it provides questions and the answers. And the value of that is that by asking certain questions, it helps us ask the right questions. Because as, as people who have come to know Jesus, as we've become following Jesus, often we're asking the wrong questions. We don't even know what the right questions are, the, the questions that really get down into what has happened because of our redemption in Jesus. What, what comes with the gospel, all that kind of stuff. And so we, a catechism helps us kind of ask the right questions. And then as part of the teaching process, it's not only ask the question, it gives you the answer. It's kind of the ultimate thing, right? Here's the question and then here's the answer. And as you'd be going through a process of learning this, you're, you're learning not only what are the questions I should be asking myself, but what is, a, what is the right answer to that? And what's the biblical foundation for it? And all that kind of stuff. So one of those is this, Westminster Catechism. And the very first question is worth the price of it. Okay? So the very first question in this catechism is this, what is the chief end of man? Now let me recraft that a little bit because that sounds a little bit maybe lofty or unapproachable or something like that. Um, the question is asking, why were we created? And what's the whole purpose of life? How do, what do we make, how do we make sense out of this? And we can personalize it. Why did God create me? What's my purpose in this life? How do I make sense out of everything that's going on? So it's a good question to ask. You know, what, what's the purpose of life? And if I don't have this one figured out, if I don't somehow have a bead on this particular question here, I am going to go through life miscuing off of everything. I won't be able to make sense out of it. I won't make sense out of my own life and what's going on around me. Um, if I don't have this one right, I can't get anything else right. So it's a great question to have. What is the chief end of man? Now here's the answer that's supplied right along with it. The chief end of man, in other words, your reason for existence, my reason, collectively all of our reason for existence is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's a great answer. I mean, that brings it all together. My reason for existence is, for one thing, to glorify God, meaning to put him on display, to, to make my life a, a showcase for who he is, to make it visible and re, in reality and all this kind of stuff, the, the wonders of, of who God is and what he has done. That's what that means, to glorify God. But then also to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, let that last part linger and enjoy him forever. The idea that, that God has, has created us not just to be good, obedient children. We should be. But that's not the, the essence of this. Not to simply be compliant followers. 
but to be those who enjoy him, who enjoy him. A um, guy by the name of John Piper, I don't know if that name pings at all in you or not, um, but years ago he wrote a book uh, that took this very phrase out of this catechism. And he made one little alteration in it that was a good alteration, I think. Instead of saying the chief end of man is to, to glorify God and enjoy him forever, he put it this way. The chief end of man, our reason for existence, is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Well, that puts a different spin, doesn't it? It's the idea that, it's, that I glorify him not by simply obedience and kind of gritting it out in life. But I glorify him by enjoying him. Isn't that a cool thing? Okay, we're done. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. I mean, you almost could. You could almost kind of fold up the tents and say, okay, that was good, let's go you know, picnic now. You know, that kind of stuff. But I'd like to take that and, and have us drop that into one particular verse of scripture. So I'd like to find your way to um, Psalm 37. Psalm 37. So whether you've got your paper Bible and you're making your way there, or you've got your tech device and you're making your way there, or you have the whole Bible memorized and you're just kind of indexing it, you know, and coming to that place, somehow make your way to Psalm 37. While you're getting there, let me give you a little bit of background on this psalm, because the background is, is what's going to add the gas to this thing, that's going to bring the jazz into it, okay? This is a psalm of David. Uh, many of the psalms are psalms of David, but this is a psalm that David wrote. But David wrote this at the end of his life. This is, that's a big deal. It, this perhaps is, it could be the last psalm he ever wrote. And why that matters is that this is not David writing as some young guy um, out in the fields with the sheep looking up at the stars and saying, I think this is what life is about. You know, it's not David you know, as some kid that, is, that has a lot of theory, but as someone who has walked through life. Someone who has experienced all the ups and downs of life. Someone who gets it. And at the end of his life, he's putting it all together. This is David after he has met Goliath in the Valley of Elah and blasted a stone through his head. This is David writing after he has had you know, Samuel come and anoint him and yet has had to run and hide in the cave of Adullam and have, have those what became known as the mighty men, those, those men from, from foreign countries that came. There were the, you know, the outcasts and so on. They, they come and they meet him with, there and they become these, this great military force. It's after all of that. It's after David has expanded the, the boundaries of Israel and conquered the enemies. It's after David has, has had these great victories after victories. But it's also after David has had his great failures in life. It's after he has had uh, moral failures with Bathsheba. It's after he has committed murder. It's after he has been a horrible, horrible father and had his sons rebel against him. It's after David has gone through all the ups and downs of life and put all this together here. So this is a guy that, this is someone who gets it. He's got the wisdom of life. And, and he comes to this last stage of life and it's like he pulls all the wisdom together here and says, this is what I've learned. This is... This is what I'm passing on to you, he's saying, as, as a result of getting life and I'm pulling it all together here. Here's the keys of life, he's saying, as he writes this. Now, the psalm is not just anything. I mean, this is perhaps one of the most beautifully crafted psalms that David ever wrote. Now, you can't see it so much in the English Bible here or whatever you got. But in the Hebrew Bible, pops. Because in the Hebrew Bible, every verse starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. 
And so it's a, an acrostic thing where it just kind of comes down like this. And within every verse, it's it pulled apart with, with a, with a uh, beautiful kind of ordering of how the Hebrew unfolds in this thing. Uh, a Jewish person reading this would, would break into tears reading it because it's so beautifully written. This is like David's masterpiece. Okay, have I set it up well enough yet? Because okay, that's all you get. Okay, so, uh, but listen to how it starts. This is important. Okay, uh, starting in verse 1. We're going to read down through the first oh, seven verses here. David writes, Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious toward wrongdoers. Now, if my translation is a little different from yours, kind of work through it with me, okay? Verse 2. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him also and he will do it. And he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Uh, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the evil man who carries on, um, who carries out wicked schemes. Okay, let me just, let me end there. There are four things that he has said here. There are four keys, and these four things actually drive the rest of the psalm. I don't know, did you notice them in there? Four things he says, these are the keys of life. You can get this down, then you got it, he's essentially saying. First thing, in verse 3, trust in the Lord. Second thing, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Third thing, verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. And then in verse 7, the last one, rest in the Lord. There's a sequence in that, but there's also some commonality to it. You probably heard it in there very easily. First of all, he says, trust in the Lord. In other words, to, to, to settle in your mind what is true, to be confident in the person that we're talking about here, to, to have uh, uh, what, um, confidence in, in who he is and, and what he has done, this trusting in the Lord. That's the starting point. Second one is the idea of delighting in the Lord. Now, hang on to that one. We're going to come back to that one. Third one, commit your way to the Lord. In other words, take your life story and drop it into God's story and, and this idea of gaining perspective because of uh, finding your story in that larger picture there. And then lastly, rest in the Lord. Leave the results to God. Now you also notice that in the part of all these things, so what David is saying is, it, don't look at these other people here. Don't look at how life seems to be working for other people. Instead, it all comes back to this key here, that everything revolves around this wonderful, redeeming God that we have. Trust in him, delight in him, commit your way to him, and rest in him. Four keys in there. Now let's roll ourselves back to that one verse. Verse 4. It says here, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, when you hear that, what part of that stands out to you? Be honest. If you're like most people, it's the second half, right? You're going, yes, this is the verse I'm looking for. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Yes, this is the one I wanted. All, this is my life verse now. Okay? All I have to do is figure out the first half, and I'll get everything I want. Am I right? Okay, you, can, you don't have to nod big. Just kind of go, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was looking for. Well, let's begin to take it apart. We're just going to take layer after layer and start to pull this verse apart a bit here for us. First thing I want you to notice is there are two words in there that's, that are kind of sound the same, kind of look the same, but are very different. Delight and desire. Delight and desire. See that in there? <clears throat> now, this, this verse wouldn't work if those words get flipped. But it's delight in the Lord, and you'll receive the desires of your heart. The difference between delight and desire. 
when I desire something, I desire what I don't have. I either don't have, I want more of it, or I don't have any of it. What I desire is something that I don't have. What I delight in is what I do have. That's the difference. I delight in what I have. I desire what I don't have. So like, let me play with this just for an image here. Uh, mentioned our granddaughter, uh, which for now we can kind of almost say we have two. Kind of, you know. But it works out this way. Um, we delight in Elliot, our granddaughter. I mean, just to be around her, it's like, oh, we delight in her. But we're desiring the, our second daughter, our second granddaughter. Uh, we're already, in the sense of desiring her, we're, we're already kind of anticipating who she will be and what personality will, she'll have. And, and how she's going to interact with, with her sister and the space she's going to fill into our lives and all this kind of stuff. We're, we're desiring her, but we delight in Elliot because she's here. Okay. Now that, that starts to play out a bit here because Mary said, delight in the Lord. It's not, it's not something that is, that is not there, but it's, it's this person who is here and all that he brings with it. This relationship is a call to, to enjoy what is already there. Now, some other observations I would just make on this as, as we're kind of looking into this statement here. One is that the statement of, of uh, delighting in the Lord is given in contrast to those first two verses. So it's like instead of getting all worked up about what you don't have, Instead of looking at other people and saying, you know, gosh, it seems like the rules got all mixed up here and the bad people are winning and, and evil people kind of seem to come out on top of things that don't get miscued on that. This is in contrast to it. And one of the contrast pieces, one of the four that are mentioned here, is to delight in the Lord. So it's given as a, a contrast, an alternative to what we normally do. But also is an imperative statement. When David is saying here, is, is not, I've got a good idea for you. I found this is kind of a, but instead it's an imperative statement. In other words, it's, it's a priority. It's something that really, really matters. And he's saying that this, this is something that needs to be rolled up to the top here, and I'm saying it in such a way that has force to it. As David says this, delight yourself in the Lord. When he says delight here, it's, um, he could have said all sorts of other things, but instead of saying, you know, be obliged to, to be obedient to God, which we should, he uses this word, delight. Instead of having intellectual interest in God, it's a far more relational idea of delighting in him. This idea of delight comes out all throughout the, the Old Testament scriptures. And there are other words that are used or other phrases to describe it. For example, <coughs> the Bible talks about rejoicing in the Lord. Same idea. You know, it's just a different way of saying it. Rejoicing in the Lord. In other words, finding your joy in him. Extolling the Lord. There's a good word. Which has to do with the idea of finding great value in him. Or praising the Lord. I mean, that's kind of one of the most common ones as you run through the psalm. Uh, the idea of celebrating him. Or glorifying the Lord. We already talked about that one. Right? Calling attention to who he is. Bless the Lord. Which means to treasure him. Or at the very core of all Jewish thinking, this idea of loving the Lord. Uh, in the Shema, in uh, Deuteronomy 6.5, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, with all your might. With, in other words, with everything you've got to love him. And the word that's used there is not an intellectual word. It's not simply a commitment word. It's a word that, that carries the idea of emotion with this thing. You shall love the Lord your God. And all these things combined carry themselves into this word that is used here to delight yourself in the Lord. Let me drill a little bit deeper into that word. The word that's used here had a whole bunch of different kind of feels to it 
and all of them combined equal what the word is. So for example, the word here for delight is a word that means to, to luxuriate in something. Now what do, you, what do you think when you think of luxuriate? One of the things I think of is it's like a spa, right? Go ahead and you just kind of lay into it, you know, and whether it's, I don't know what you do with it, in the mud or something like that, or, or a massage kind of, Or maybe when you go out in a picnic or something like that and you just lay out in the sun and it's like, oh, it feels so good. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. You have a picture going with it? That's part of the word. That's just part of it, though. It's also a word that's, that has to do with um, the idea of savoring something. Any of you foodies? <laughs> any, come on, you can own up. Okay, well, any foodies? Okay, some of you are just covert foodies. I brought this up in, in other settings, and everybody goes, yes! You know. <clears throat> so if you're not one, you're just going to have to take our word for it and, and run with this. But, but it's the idea of when you, when you taste something, and that it's not just for the sake of wolfing something down, and, and you're starving, and so you want to eat something, and you're done. But rather, when you, you taste something that is wonderful, and you kind of, oh, Oh, that is so good. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Just the other night, um, some good friends of ours had us over for dinner. Now, this is one they had talked about for a long time. In fact, it was a Christmas gift that is just now happening. Okay. These, these, are, uh, these, <laughs> these friends of ours are like the ultimate foodies. So they've gone to some of the biggest restaurants in the country. And you're familiar with the, the French Laundry restaurant? Okay, okay now this is, a, this is where the dividing line is. If you know what the French Laundry is, then you are a foodie. If you don't, you're a pretend foodie. Okay, uh, but they have, you know, the French Laundry is one of these just super high class restaurants uh, up in Yonville. And I mean, you have to get like reservations like a year or so out to get in at all. They've been four times. In fact, uh, <laughs> With this friend of mine, Phil, when he, when he calls in, they, they know who he is. Now, I think that's because they bring it up on the computer and say, oh, yes, uh, you've been here. Uh, so these are the people that had us over for dinner. And they, the, they, they build this as a French laundry dinner. And so they had um, taken from the French laundry some things. Um, I mean, they had the recipes, but they also had, had like the little clothes pins and, and all, they had all sorts of stuff they brought in. So they made it out to be a big deal and had spent a ton of time preparing this meal. Like everything on, on the plate and on any given um, uh, serving that came to us had been, there had been all sorts of things that went into every single element on it that took the entire day and gathering the special ingredients and all sorts of amazing things into it. And so as we went through this meal, it was, it was one of these things where you take a taste and you just, oh, that is so good. And just kind of up in itself as we went through this thing. Amazing. That's the word. Okay, so now you bring these pieces together, you get luxuriating, savoring. It's the idea of taking pleasure in something so you can think whatever it is that brings you pleasure and just even the thought of it kind of excites you. That's the word that's used here. It carries the idea of enjoying something in exquisite um, and delicacies and all this kind of stuff flow into it. It's a word that works this way all the way down to modern Hebrew. In fact, if you go to Israel today, this word is still in use. You know what it means? Think for a moment. The word, if you go to Israel today, the word means party. It's the word for party. It takes all these ideas and brings them down to the idea of getting together and, and boom, having this great time. Now you have to think Jewish when you think of party. Okay, this is not this is not Swedish party. Oh, we get together. We're having a good time. This is Jewish party. Boom! Where all these ideas come together 
<clears throat> and we're, we're having this wonderful time. That's the idea of this word. Delight yourself in the Lord, he says. To savor the wonder of who he is. To luxuriate in him. To find deep, great pleasure in him. As one of the keys to life. Delight yourself, he says, in the Lord. Now that's important. We're still in the first line here. Remember, we're unfolding a piece at a time. Delight yourself in the Lord as opposed to anything else. It doesn't mean you don't delight yourself in anything else in life. But to have as your ultimate desire, your ultimate delight in life, him. And that's important because there's so many other things that can kind of encroach on that and start to take the place of that. We can find our greatest fulfillment in life, our greatest delightment in life, life is somewhere else. And David is saying, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Bring this back here. Because this is where ultimately it all comes down to. Delight yourself in the Lord. It's an intentional redirecting of our ultimate fulfillment. It's, I heard it described one way uh, by one person this way. It says, uh, to enjoy uh, the pleasure uh, of knowing him. Explore the, the delight and the pleasure of knowing him. This, this wonder as we uh, develop our relationship with him of finding a deeper and greater pleasure in him continuously. Delight yourself in him. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, David encountered uh, which is part of why he talks about it this way. And one of the things that I know that I've experienced, and perhaps you've experienced as well on different levels, is that, that sin ruins our appetite for God. That when we allow ourselves to find something else to step in there and become our ultimate fulfillment, to become what is really our ultimate delight in life, it takes away the ability to delight in God. It's, it's this idea, of, it's kind of like, you know, it, with this meal I had the other night. If I had gone out that afternoon and gone to McDonald's and just wolfed down a bunch of stuff. I'm sorry, if you're a McDonald's fan, you're not a foodie. But, uh, but, <laughs> but if I had done that and just kind of, you know, a couple of Big Macs and all that, and then gone to that meal, it would have been an entirely different experience because I would have already been filled with something else. So the, the wonder and the beauty of that meal would have been lost on me. So David's kind of, he's zeroing us in on this thing. Instead of coming to God continuously like we do to, to get something from him, to instead come because we want more of him himself. Delight yourself in the Lord, he says. Now, we have a good picture of that going on that? Now the next verse. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, some of you are starting to lean forward. Okay. This is the part I'm waiting for. Okay, I, I, I stuck with you through the first half. Now give me the goods. And when you get to the second half here, he will give you the desires of your heart. I want you to notice what it says here. It doesn't say he will give you what you really need. Right? Because somehow that's, that can be one way we kind of take this thing. And say, well, delight yourself. It's, it's not that you're going to get what you want. It's that he's going to give you what you need. It's not what it says. It says he will give you the desires of your heart. It doesn't say that delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you what you really should have. No. He'll give you the, the desires of your heart. Um, the word desire here becomes critical. And, and not to take, not to kind of let the air out of your tires on this thing. Instead to kind of amplify it. Because the word that's used here carries the idea of your deepest longings. Not just your whims, not just the, the latest thing that, that kind of happens across you or captures your attention or any of that stuff. 
It's a word that carries the idea of what, what you deeply desire, you long for. Um, it's a word that carries the idea of the cry of the heart. I thought that was a good way of describing it. What deep down inside you, your heart is saying, I long for. And the thing is that, that in life, so much of the time, we try and find things to solve that. There's a longing inside us, a desire for something, and we think that if I can just get this, I'll be okay. That that's really what I want. Or that, that if I can get into this relationship with this person, that's what I really, really, want, really want. And that somehow the longing inside me is going to be satisfied. And part of what David is writing about is, I've been down the road, guys. It doesn't work that way. That even when you, you get some of these things with kind of the whims of life or the, the, the passing fad of something that you, <coughs> that you think you want and, and do kind of want, but, but in getting that, you find that, nah, it, it didn't work. There's still a cry in the heart for something. And the thing is this, that, that ultimately every single desire that we have Every desire is ultimately a desire for Jesus. If you track it back, every single desire is ultimately a desire for Jesus. And with that, David can very confidently say, it's, it's, not, it's not like if you get this, then the, the, the magic goes poof and you get something. But rather, if you delight yourself in the Lord, as we've described, what you get is exactly what you want. I mean, it's just, he is the desire of the heart. And by delighting in him, the equation works. This equals this. And David had, he was one that had, for his, his time in, in life on this earth here, he had everything a man could possibly want. Everything. And he found that ultimately, the greatest thing, the, the only thing that his heart really longed for was God himself. And so he puts this in here. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Because every desire is ultimately a desire for him. So now, let's roll back here. We started with this Westminster Confession. Remember that? Okay. That was our launch pad. What is the chief end of man? No, that's personalized. What is, what is the chief end of me? The, the purpose for my life, the reason why I was created, the thing that brings it all together, the, the centerpiece of it all. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is, is to glorify God, put him on display, and to enjoy him forever to delight in him, to luxuriate in him. Or as John Piper would say, to glorify God by enjoying him forever. God calls us into a relationship that is not primarily built around obedience. It's not primarily built around being the best, you know, being good people and not causing him grief. He calls us into a relationship that is centered around loving him, of finding our greatest pleasure in knowing him and in being with him and being drawn close to him and discovering new things about him. That's what it's about. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of opening your words and and seeing here your words and, and having you speak to us. We thank you for this particular psalm and this particular verse out of this psalm. And we ask that it would sink deeply into us and that we would find ourselves turning it over in our minds uh, the rest of today and on into this week and for the rest of our lives, realizing that this is the very reason why you created us to come into relationship with you and to delight in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.